Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the big old spinning ball of stuff. My name is Jade Star. This is How to App on iOS. And today is a great day. I'm really stoked today to have the amazing Heimbach on the show. We're going to kick off with some of his music.
If you ever had any doubts that creativity was dead, I hope they're gone, and that tape is dead, get that from your mind. Welcome to the show, everybody. My name is Jade Starr. If you don't know who I am, I am a transgender musician and YouTube content creator here. This is uh, my show, How to App on iOS, and every week I'm lucky enough to speak to some of the most, the newest and some of the most experienced and amazingly creative minds in music, art, theatre, um, film, whatever it is, as long as it's creative, I'm into it and I hope you are too. And today, I'm really, really privileged to have somebody who's a massive influence on my other side of my musical uh, creation, uh, making a uh, avant noise, avant uh, dark, creative, expressive frequencies, challenging the norms of sound. Um, he's somebody who is very humble and uh, offers knowledge to people on a, on a, a daily basis through uh, his YouTube channel and his Patreon uh, account. Um, so without further ado, I would like to welcome um, <laughs> the amazing Heinbach to the show. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you for coming on. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. Are you going well today or this evening? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm editing a video uh, all day basically on this thing, like uh, the Make Noise Traeger, the new synthesizer that they made. And then I started live prep for a little Gesprächskonzert, a concert like not really a concert, but it's at the Magpie Fest this Saturday. I'll be playing at 10 uh, p.m. Berlin time, and I'll just be playing different parts of my studio and talking about what I do there. Not really a show, but more like come into my studio and let's, I'm going to play something for you. So, yeah, that's what I'm preparing to right now. So a busy day, awesome. busy day. I was just about to ask, so are you guys playing shows there? But clearly you're doing it in your own studio. How, how is... um. How has the, the uh, whole events of last year affected you um, performing <laughs> live? <laughs> I yeah. miss it. I miss it a lot. And I miss playing in front of people. That's why I don't really want to do like a stream show anymore. I did two that I found or three that I found beautiful. And the first one that was uh, yeah just on the balcony and my neighbor, she's also my visual artist. I just throw her like an HDMI cable from my camera. <laughs> she could do visuals upon that and film me from the balcony. So that was really lovely and really cool. And then I did one with a scanner where we ate and processed the sounds that we're doing while we're eating. That was also again really lovely. But I mean the sheer amount of time you have to invest in playing a live stream it's a week, a week of work, and then it's got, it's gone. It's once it's out there, it's basically yeah. done. So I got stream fatigued in regards to playing shows. I was fortunate enough to be able to play a real show right, like, uh, right before, not like a month before, like the big lockdown again happened in Europe and the Philharmonic in Bialystok in Poland, and that was amazing. So I'm still like, still drawing from that show, <laughs> but yeah. Playing live is something that I really miss. Also theater, I, there's theater plays that have never seen the light of day because we only went to the dress rehearsal and then pff, frozen. Mm -hmm. So that, the whole life part, that has been kind of bad. But of course, I, I quickly like pivoted to different things and I did stuff that helped like, uh, that helped uh, to compensate for that, like making apps. And I guess also that's the reason why yeah, I'm here. Sure. Uh, and like another thing we talk on this uh, uh, show is about gas, about gear acquisition syndrome. How did that go down during the pandemic? Did you end up buying a lot more stuff? Yes, <laughs> so much more. And that's, I did a big change. And the big change is I used to have this thing that everything I buy has to be able to accompany me on my travels because for theater music, I have to travel a lot. So I preferred like little boxes of things like maybe a small modular, something portable, and then just working with that. But 
after half a year of this, I realized this is not really sensible yeah. anymore to have like things that uh, it doesn't make sense. And um, I also quite enjoyed the studio life. So I've actually started working on my studio more. I'm going to get uh, acoustics, proper acoustics, not the DIY stuff that they threw on the wall. Um, and then, of course, there's always things to experiment and I went down crazy like rabbit holes, for example, phasers and stuff. And then there's a lot of stuff. Now I've got triple justifications for buying anything. First, I can make music with it. Second, I can make a video with it. Third, it's a business expense. <laughs> <laughs> and fourth, I might be something that gives me ideas for a new plugin or a new app. So there's all these ways that it becomes sensible to have gas or so I tell myself. <laughs> yeah, we all do. <laughs> we're all guilty. Hands up everybody in the chat. So <laughs> we're all guilty. <laughs> Let me start. I want to ask you the question. I ask everybody first who comes on the show. Um, and I, I know it's a very broad question, but Heinbach, what does music mean to you? Oh, it's the thing that gave me a uh, direction in life. Before I discovered music, before I was on stage with my first band, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no real idea. And then I was up there, played a sequence of notes and forget everything about the whole show. And I realized, okay, this is the thing that I want to do for the rest of my life. And I basically tried to move my life all into the music. And that I'm so happy that that worked out. And it's been a process over so many years to just make music, to make more music, to make more music, to make more music. But at least I was always making music. So it's it's been a long time. It's definitely something that's grown. So yeah, but I, I like right now where I am with that. It makes me makes me happy. Um, what what do you actually consider your music? to be what do you, does it fall into a genre do you have a pet name for it or anything like that the main thing that i see in my music is that there's always some form of narration even they try, I try to tell the story and that starts uh with the way that i structure the tracks with the sounds that i choose and then goes on to stuff like uh the titles and then of course to the whole sequencing of an album and the text that i write when i do this album so there's one thing that i always do is before i save uh, a track and i give it a name so there's never any more like funky beat 17 or something <laughs> on my hard drive <laughs> That helps so much. Once you name something, you commit to it, and it's there. Yeah. <laughs> but Funky Beat 17, <laughs> it's kind of not. <laughs> so Final Mix 3. So that's kind of like, I, 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 that's something. So this whole process of narration is in my music. And I think you can feel it across all the genres that I work uh, in. Be it the test equipment stuff that I just released, Schwebungsummer, um, it's the most recent album, and uh, or the ambient music. Uh, always there's something to be discovered story-wise i feel beautiful um I, I i that's probably the best advice i have ever heard on this show about uh naming songs because I, i'm sure everybody's <laughs> got a a gra garage band folder full of uh project zero zero three three two <laughs> the automatic numbering that we get and it's a terrible thing mm -hmm. to go back through that so Make sure you name your songs, folks. Just something that you rem can remind yourself with. Uh, do, do, do you recall, uh, what, what was the music you recall as a child that was played throughout your household by your parents? There wasn't a lot of music. I think like my father, he played like uh, big band mm -hmm. stuff, um, like uh, jazz from the 40s and 50s a lot. And then he would whistle to oh, that. Nice. Uh, that was something that always came from a little recorder in his home. My mother, she used to play piano. She uh, still, still plays like classical piano, so preferably something slow like Chopin. So these were basically, so from, from upstairs came that piano, from downstairs came that. We never put on records. So like my father never sat down, yeah, come on, listen to this. Or my mother, hey, come on, listen to this. That wasn't a thing. 
so music was uh, uh, there. My sister, of course, she had a record player and she had friends over and they would all be like smoking in their room. She's way older than I. She's 11 years older. So I was always like I was the young, the, the small ch child, like running and the 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 obnoxious brother always wanted to play with all her cool friends. <laughs> <laughs> so they listened to, of course, all the stuff like Neue Deutsche Welle at the time, like Nina and uh, uh, all these like, um, yeah, the the. German music of the 80s then I remember like l uh, there's there were records by Pink Floyd in her record collection and then Bachmann Overdrive or something a lot of stuff but uh, yeah basically that was came from her room so these three rooms were where the music was happening but none of none of my family sat down and said hey you have to listen to this that's so I learned music later, like the first time I remember like really being absolutely mesmerized by music was Kraftwerk, We Are The Robots, that I listened to at a friend's home because this older brother put it on, was like, we are the robots. And I was like, what, 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 what this is, what is this? Robots, cool. This is even cooler than being a space pirate in Captain Future. So this was, this was definitely there. And then, of course, lots of chip tune. My friends, we played hours upon hours C64 C games. So those sounds C were chip there. Forever. <laughs> yeah, sit chips. Exactly. And then um, for me, I got an Amiga. I bought an Amiga. And uh, oh, my parents bought an Amiga for me. And I played a lot of Amiga games. And they listened to a ton of music on the Amiga. And they even gave my piano teacher then a cassette with the tune and she would have to transcribe it oh. for me so i could play like leisure suit larry <laughs> oh, and stuff like that. that's commitment i love it so that was basically the early music education that i had and of course piano lessons as i just as you could get gathered from what were I said, you yeah. a good student <laughs> mm, when i could play the game sound yes <laughs> so i it was always more duty than anything else. Like I have to do ten, I have to play tennis, and I have to play piano. So and tennis I really didn't like, and piano I was like, okay, this is kind of kind of good once I can do something with it. And I could play stuff by the Beatles, Stones, and uh, like I remember like watching like what was this show? I think it was called Nam or something like a Vietnam uh, series or something. And then they, I heard like for, for the first time, Painted Black. I think it was 12 or 13 was like, what's this this is cool i want to play this so i learned to learn i learned to play painted black on the piano awesome. and uh stuff like that and then yeah the, the doing the game music uh kind of saved it for me more at some point she just stopped because i played her the character creation screen music from eye of the beholder <laughs> and that's just an a minor and an e minor and i think there might be a d7 in there somewhere but it's really just that she just told me that and I was, but i can't play it without notation because i had never actually learned the chords but of course i also realized oh this very minimal very peaceful music of the character creation screen creation screen of eye of the beholder one on the amiga is something that i enjoy my first keyboard was actually um, on my commodore 64 it was that little plastic bit that sat over the top of the keyboard you know <laughs> the little plastic keys <laughs> It was so awful mm -hmm. to play. But like I thought, I thought I was amazing yeah. on it, but I was horrible. I'm still horrible these days. <laughs> um, so, was your teacher? Did you ha uh, have a mean teacher or? A Cause I, well, what do you mean? I, I, people often uh, with their musical teachers, that you either get like a mean teacher who smacks you on the hand, or like is somebody who really, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, okay, yeah. sorry, I didn't acoustic. I, I had like different ones i had like one uh, that i really liked uh, she came from the philippines so when i went to her place uh, you would have all these artifacts from uh, the philippines because yeah seafaring people so there would be a giant stuffed turtle under the table there would be all these bamboos and then there would be like battle axes and swords on the wall and i was like what is this place <laughs> and then i would go down and like play on the piano on the melodica first with my first piano teacher so yeah that was my first teacher then i had a second teacher she was very 
she told me a lot of wrong things. She told me to hold my hands like a potato. So there's a hot potato in there, which resulted in oh, a very wow, cramped yeah. pose. Because when you do this, it just goes up here. So this is really yeah. wrong. So you should just should use the support of the keys. She t taught me wrong. And she would do up, up, up on my fingers, you know, Ooh. up, up, up. Uh, so, but then again, she introduced me to some cool stuff like Bartok. So that was nice. But yeah, so she was a horrible teacher. And then I had a very good teacher and she was the one in the end that would, uh, yeah, uh, would like try to see how to get me to play, which any uh, teacher, yeah, if you find something that someone loves and then you support it, that's a good way to teach someone about music. Definitely. So, yeah. um, I'm always interested in this for some reason. So, uh, and I, I kind of add this on the end of the question. So the first piece of music that was you either bought or was purchased for you and what format was it on? I'm, I'm assuming tape. <laughs> no. no, I think the first music, the first, the first record that I that I told my parents to buy me because I loved it was Doctor Who soundtrack. Oh, wow! Uh, and it was on vinyl, and it had the original theme. And I just I listened to it back like a few uh, a, a few weeks ago, and the record is completely scratched up because my friends, oh, you got the record, kick, kick, kick. They were trying to do this <laughs> badly and squeak, squeak, squeak. So it's really bad. And also, it's like it was like from mm, the soundtrack was from the. I think early, er, like like from the time of Doctor Who, like late 80s, early 90s. So it was uh, lots of like reversions of the original theme on like DX7 and stuff. And it didn't have the grid of the original theme anymore. But luckily that was on there. And that was the only thing I listened to from that whole uh, record. Awesome. Um, I'm just going to say hello to the folks in the chat and run through a few names because uh, we like to do that here. So, look, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, I, I'm always thankful so much for you all being here. So it's Pain to Get and Deep Gravity, Joey Helpish, uh, who else? Lady Rodeline Straight. Uh, going through the, I'm probably going to miss a whole lot of you today. So I think Scott was here earlier. I saw his name. Uh, Saint Moz, Tom Rochelle, one of our great... Uh, Mods, also Cold Acre, Nina, and we can't forget Dr. Zorders. Uh, Pete Johns is here today. Uh, I think I saw Doug from the sound test room. Russ, Joe's here. We've got so many people. Dean Thomas, uh, Bubba. There are uh, an absolute plethora of you all here today. Let me scroll down a little bit more, catch a few of you. Uh, Ilvi, I, I forgot how to say it, see? I'm, I'm shocking with that. O'Neill and Jones, welcome to you too. Um, Cy, welcome to you. Thank you all for being here. Electronic Sounds Audio, good day to you. Peanut Cram, if I've missed you all, I'll catch up and do another shout out a little bit later. So thank you very much. Uh, so interesting. What was your first piece of audio equipment? Because you've got a lot of it. My first piece of audio equipment. Well, the first one, uh, like the first one that I choose. Yeah. yeah, that I think that was like this Yamaha Entertainer keyboard because I was asked by the, by like uh, brother and sister, and uh, if I want to join their band at school, and I said, yeah, sure, I can do that. And so we met up, and it was pretty disaster, but it was good enough. So then I said, okay, so now I need to get like my own keyboard. So I bought a secondhand Yamaha like entertainer keyboard, one of those preset keyboards because it had a decent organ sound because the band was all about psychedelic rock door oh, wow. stuff and uh, stuff like that. <laughs> so I got that because of the organ sound and the string sound. And just because it didn't look cool, I painted it. Like I painted it, I made it look like, uh, for some reason, I don't know why, maybe because I loved uh, Puppy Boyington and the, what the, the flying, like this, like this uh, Second World War series uh, about this uh, aeroplane people. Uh, <laughs> Airplane people, no. Uh, airplane fighters fighting like Zeros, uh, Japanese versus the Americans. And so I, I, thought, I thought the Zeros looked very cool. So I painted it like a, basically like a Zero. <laughs> and <laughs> just to make it look less crappy on stage. So, yeah. Um, I, I, I find it interesting because, you know, your music that you create now, I, I, I often wondered, like, you know, did you come from that background of actually, you know, bands and stuff and, and doing all that? So... So bands were a thing, have been a thing of your 
your past yeah 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 definitely i started with a band that was called blue yellow drive <laughs> <laughs> because the singer tried to remember an ice cream and i think that's what she came up with that was the name of the band suddenly and then i had another band that was called the dance inc you can still find stuff on youtube there was a wave pop outfit like started like kind of electro punk then went more to wave pop and uh, then uh I think the next bands that I had, they were like very crowdy, modular, but with guitars, and I really liked them. One was called Jobs with two Bs, and the other one was called Kudelski after the inventor of the Nagra tape recorder. And those were, yeah, very crowdy, very uh, electronic driven, yet very also guitar and bass. So, very, I really liked those bands. But at that time, like, it was super hard to get bands to oh you found that <laughs> clip okay the dancing don't run yeah, so yeah there you can see me uh not, not that's not me that's a singer but you can see me jumping around to uh yeah there's me <laughs> jumping around to the music and pretending to play the keyboard <laughs> oh, wow. the classic white room <laughs> yeah, video awesome. you look very different there but then don't we all <laughs> back, back in the old days? Uh, yeah 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 that's that's a lot yeah. of years ago <laughs> But at least I'm playing a Juno 60 there. So, <laughs> very good. Ass. And look at the mic, the <laughs> mic of the thing. I really love that. That mic. is massive. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, um, so, so, obviously, this keyboard uh, created this love affair with uh, uh, equipment that you have because equipment is uh, clearly like uh, behind you. And, and anybody who's followed you on YouTube or, you know, your career knows that equipment is such a huge thing like what what got you into the whole uh i mean uh, with synthesizers and then moving on to test equipment and, and and tape and all this what is it that really excites you about that stuff oh behind every new piece there's like a new story or there's like a new world especially if it's stuff that isn't meant to music and it's always the sense of discovery and discovering new stuff is something that i absolutely enjoy one of my favorite books um, as a kid was called The Great Explorers. And it was just, there was just, there was no binding around. It was just this blue cover with the small golden ship. And it told stories of the Arctic explorers and stuff like that. And I thought, oh, this is very cool. And I want to explore. And then the way that I decided to explore things is via sound. And so using science equipment to explore sound and then turn that into a massive kick drum is a combination of all the things that I love. Yeah, I'm just bringing up some uh, photos here of some of your gear because uh, <laughs> in the walls mm -hmm. of gear, anybody who's uh, watched your channel, it's, I'm always amazed. I look at it and I get scared seeing all that gear. I'm like, mm -hmm. how do you maintain all these? Like, I, I look at my studio and think, what the hell i've just got to route a few channels and i get lost in it for days going i, I can only imagine like a, you know is it do you actually have um do you go to sleep and sometimes have nightmares about patching audio and stuff and ground looping and all that kind of thing no only dreams about patches <laughs> good only dreams. good dreams i really dream of wires <laughs> so the like uh like it's I've got so much stuff downstairs that needs service and there's so much stuff that needs repair and should be serviced and that's fine uh, because it's I, just, I decided I won't do that myself beyond like opening up and seeing if there's, there's like a loose cable. So that's kind of a source of frustration for me, but I found a few techs because like tech time, tech, techs in Berlin take forever because there's so much demand for techs. So it always like, okay, so you have a three months to half a year waiting period on anything. And oh yeah, that's a more, that's a more recent yeah. picture. So there's stuff that I love. You can see to the left, there are all these uh, brilliant care filters, which are passive. So they never break. <laughs> there's no electronics in there. I love those. They're, yeah. 
And what I try to like balance right now is the amount of vintage gear versus the new gear. So I got a lot of fancy new gear for the absolute essentials, like the plumbing, like the speakers or the camera that I'm using here. I got like, okay, this mic is also like also 15 years old already, but it's reliable. It just works. So I try to keep the stuff that's absolutely essential, always working. And uh, when something else fails, I usually have like some sort of other way to do the thing that I want to do. One thing is that sometimes really bums me is the wire recorder. And that's part of the reason why I made a plugin out of it, because sometimes just in the most inopportune moment, you get a dratris, meaning the wire breaks. And then it's such a fumbly operation to get that back together because the wire recorder is here and then you're there and then it's like, oh, it's, a, uh, it's always like, I always don't want to make music anymore when that happens. So now I can just, okay, so, okay, let's, I can maybe use the plugin. It's okay. It's good. <laughs> so that's like a save for me. So yeah, that's stuff that can be, that can bite, but yeah, else all like the tape machines, everything just works right now. And that's something very important. And one thing that I also do is comp compartmentalize, I think yeah. that's the word. So I've got a station there that's almost like where I can work with the piano and the modular on its own. Then I've got a station here. Uh, can you see? I'm just going to step down with my Soviet keyboards and the Fismo. And then I've got this station, which I just finished. That's over here. Yep. Yeah, the other side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, which is like a tier 707 and lots of synthesizers and a four track. So I can just record onto the four track. And yeah, some synths that I just want to integrate there. And then it goes on like this. Behind me, there's over there, there's the wall of test equipment, which just works on its own also. Also, again, connected to a four track. And I've got a keyboard section here. So everything is basically like it works on its own very well. And that's kind of like, and then it comes all together here on the mixing board. So I can combine everything if I want to, but I don't have to. Um, Dr. Zordas, oh, I didn't say his name right. Dr. Zordas in the chat has asked, do you have a big electric bill? <laughs> it goes up. <laughs> it goes up and up. So, but generally, generally, like most of the, like a modern computer sucks, uh, sucks a lot of power yeah. already. So some of these things are actually very low power, even though they waste a lot in heat because... I sometimes have really heat problems here because this room when everything is on gets really yeah. warm and some of the gear needs a lot of space between because the heat travels up and then pff, it just some things that are up top just blow up because it gets too hot. So that's something I have to always be aware of, like how the airflow moves. And from the get go, I planned everything in the studio to be like, I'm using this, so now I'm turning only this on. Now I'm using this, so now I'm only turning this on. So I can only work, I can completely work with this side of the studio without having turned on this side. So uh, wasteful, for example, now is that I put on the light show for you. <laughs> There's a modular blinking only for the light show, but that's show business. <laughs> so I can. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's something I have to afford. So please join my Patreon to help me play with my electric. Definitely do that. Definitely no. do that. Yeah. I, was, I, yeah. I love that your, so. your studio, you, you treat more like a, um, a, 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 a PCI board on your, on your computer. With, you've got your cooling, uh, <laughs> your cooling setup. Keep these things running so the room stays cool enough for everything to work. Because my, my little, my little <laughs> studio here, I live on a third floor. So um, a, a third story house and the house gets so hot here in Australia. Currently, I think it's like um, only 20 degrees Celsius outside. But in my room, it's currently 30, 33 degrees. <laughs> it's horrible. Ooh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. What is it um, about? Uh, I, I want to talk about tape now. So what is it about tape that gets you super excited? Because there's a lot of people, I just want to say, because there's a lot uh, of people who are young and have no idea what tape is. Well, when I started out, it was yeah. all I had. They didn't really like it because there was so much hiss. And that was at that time always was the sign of the professional record was there was no hiss. And if you have your record with, if your record or demo sounds full of hiss, everybody knows, oh, yeah, demo, yeah. blah. So, uh, 
then when someone like when mini disc came around every i was like oh so cool no more hiss and clean very nice and that was a difference and digital audio workstation super cool everything clean very clean but um at some point i I'm always interested like in how things were done in the past. Yeah. I studied musicology and I learned a lot how uh, Pierre Schaefer, Stockhausen and all these people did music and I was always curious about that. So when at some point, I think it was in 2013, the option came that I could buy a Nagra, like an old school film recorder from 1964. Uh, I think it was back in the Muff Wiggler forum then. I thought, hey, yeah, I really, I want to try working with tape loops. I just want to try it. So I got one and that changed my life because working, first I used it as a recorder and just the sound of the recording onto the Nagra was absolutely crazy. It just, it just blew my mind how it sounded. And then I thought, yep, this is something that I need to do more. And I used to the Nagra first for recording, hence the band called Kudelski also, because we recorded all our tracks directly onto the Nagra. And if we recorded to digital, we would track through the Nagra because it had such fantastic preamps. And then you would have the tape saturation. It's a wonderful, wonderful front end for any recording. So that was, I used the Nagra as much as I could. And then comes the thing that all that happens i need to travel and the nagra is also very heavy with batteries i think it weighs close to 14 kilograms 30 pounds oh. or something so it's not something that works well so i tried to find a replacement and i found a marans pmd 222 recorder which is a very nice tape recorder and cassette recorder and i started using that and recording my modular straight onto that because i just preferred the finished sound that it had and I released albums that were completely tape recordings onto that or onto the Nagra. And it made me skip the whole workflow of working like with 30 tracks in the digital audio workstation in favor of a performance captured in a way that makes it sound finished. And at some point when a theater was working on, um, I got gifted a very beautiful Telefunken tape machine. So now I could do absolutely high-end recording where it gets tough for people to even know, is this a tape recording or is this a digital recording? And that I basically changed my life around that because I realized I could make more tracks and in less time and I wouldn't fumble around too much in the audio workstation. And that also helped with my uh, tendonitis because that's something that I easily mm. get and not having to click anything when I'm working with uh, music helps a lot because music, I've trained myself very much to go into a flow state when I make music. So I'm completely lost in the music. And if you then get, if, and if you combine that with tendonitis where you need to take like regular breaks and stuff to not yeah, uh, make it more, that's really yeah. bad. So I've got no problem editing video for hours because I absolutely take breaks because I'm not in a flow with the video editing. It's just something that I do. But with music, I love being 100% there and the tape enabled yep. that. So, and then of course, all the creative possibilities of looping and degrading sound with knives and uh, going into a world that's unsynced and free. That's from the grid. That was something that as a next step, got me to delve very deep into tape. And then the simple act of physical manipulation of the sound by pulling it. I mean, you've got something recorded, then you pull it, goes faster, goes slower, it wobbles, and then you can stop it. It's very direct. And that's something that I've used in the theater to great effect. It's amazing to see like an actor hear a recording of their voice on a loop across like eight meters, 10 meters, and then be able to play their voice. They all fall in love yeah. so fast when they can do that tape. That's a lot of things already. And maybe it also, there's not much of a nostalgic element for me yeah. to tape. So because, yeah, I didn't really like it uh, when I was young. I thought it was bad. <laughs> but um, I appreciate what it does now and appreciate the workflow that it that works well for me. It's, it 
there's definitely a re resurgence of um, old school methods of creativity coming. I mean, uh, with film as well, because I mean, you know, you, talking about tape there, you know, you think about something like Star Wars when that was made and the, the technology they used with, you know, using film and, and drawing on film and scratching on film and, and superimposing film. There seems to be this massive resurgence of music that, you know, people talk a lot about the battle of, um, of loudness with Spotify and stuff, but there's also this other battle going on of like the old coming back in. Uh, with you know, look, just look at some of the apps that are on iOS last year alone. So many apps released to fuck up your sound. Like, <laughs> just mm -hmm. um, do 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 you see this as a? How, how do you see this? Uh, do, you, do you see this as? Um, because I see it moving into the popular music um, as well. People messing with sound too is this going to be a fad is it going to disappear what what do you think about that it's just another tool in uh the toolkit of musicians i yep. think like lo-fi is something that's in hip-hop very mm -hmm. big and people just use plugins for that but uh, it's also a lot of fun to do this in for real so and i mean in i just love like for example in our plugin um gauss which i did with brambos we got a mode that's 1989 and that simulates basically the sample and bitrate of the first sound blaster cards because i felt it was cool to to have something in there that would really feel digital and would explore the beauty of digital because when you crush it there's all these hidden melodies and overtones that come from the aliasing, from the bouncing of the frequency of the Nyquist. So there's suddenly there are new worlds and you get something new. And uh, that was something that really interested me. So, but in general, the possibility of making something sound from another time or distance is about as important as a reverb, for example. You put something into a different space, like one space is in mm -hmm. space, and then you're able to move it through time, basically. So, I mean, one of one of very nice trick that's employed so often in movies, and I've done in theater a lot, is like you have something like a track coming from a small radio and it sounds very like a radio, and then you get like a zoom or something and suddenly the track is full on on everything, you know? It's like from the whole PA and now the stumping. So that's moving both through time and space, yeah. you know? I, I love to, um, I was, uh, going just back going back through some of your videos and you were talking about um, one of the theater productions that you did how each night there's this a very dark performance and you'd created this uh, this dark theme for it and you would actually perform it live each night using tape like it so it wasn't recorded is that, that's right yeah I'm, I, I understood that right yeah the actors would perform the music on yeah, tape yeah. loops so they had their sounds and then they would like have two tape machines, three tape machines, and then perform the sound, their voice, the music with that. And that's was that's really, really it it's at first it can be a bit uh, bit like overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And then it just becomes fun. And of course then you've got all these like sound guys looking very anxiously at their tape machines <laughs> or you have me looking anxiously at the tape machine what the actors are doing with them because actors on stage will mistreat everything it's just the thing it's like if it's there on stage it's gonna die very likely but uh tape is so resilient and so tough the tape machines none of these ever had a problem that couldn't be fixed by simple like cleaning it up maintaining it well seeing if the heads are aligned still and then just go so tape machines built most of them are built to such a high standard it's uh it's amazing even like consumer machines like by sony they're still like they don't break yeah. so I, I expect too, like and uh the uh seeing something like that see i love uh performance art things like that where i love unpredictability and um you know, I, I, it was it was that the case with those performances where you know each time the tapes being moved by, um, and and manipulated by the the actress, 
that you are getting a different kind of um, bunch of frequencies and different sounds each night. So if, if you saw the performance at a different time, you'd walk away with different feelings, yeah? I don't know if you would walk away with different feelings because in the end, this is all part of a larger yeah. narration. Yeah. You know, the narration is like, it's, it's just one part of a whole performance and you would get different frequencies. You would get different sounds. Sometimes it would stop and funny words or something that could evoke a laugh. Sometimes it would sound grueling and noisy. So that could in that scene change something. But in the end, the whole thing in the play is built to work yeah. together as a whole. So you can't have like in the at least in the place that I did, you can't have two two. Uh, two different things from what would happen. You can have stuff like the tape breaking and then the actor is to live with that and play with the broken tape, which is absolutely possible with the tape loop or has to like uh, take another one from somewhere out of his pants or something. And uh, it's also I, I, it's also so fun like to see all these new ideas about like I always wondered how I, even I can take my tape loops with me when I tour and for the production like uh, I think it was the director she said can we put it in a pillbox in a pillbox i you must be joking and i was and then i was like maybe not maybe yes and then i learned that you could really fold up like a tape loop of whatever length like so tiny that it fits in one of those tiny pill boxes yeah. so just a bit of work just put your two fingers here and then you spool it around it takes like two minutes five minutes and then you've got your loop and then you can take it with you it just makes tear down after a show a bit more complicated <laughs> and longer, but still you can travel with tape loops that way easily. So I've got a question in the chat from Joey Helpish who's asked, I'm curious if Adelia Durbanshire is an influence on Heinbach and if Doctor Who and the Radiophonic Workshop was an inspiration in what you do. Well, it was yeah. the first record that I had my parents <laughs> buy me, so it's a huge influence. And I, yeah, I might be working on something, uh, yeah, that is related to the BBC Radiophonic Workshop next. So I'm not gonna, I can't say anymore. <laughs> but yeah, so it's in general, there is a, there is a whole, uh, it, I have a whole lot of appreciation for that. I just got the, uh, what's the big book called? I have it like in the other room um, about the Radiophonic Workshop to dive more into it. I, I, I read like lo everything online. I watched documentaries and everyone who worked there in the whole, because the whole process of the Radiophonic Workshop is so different to the German Elektronische Musikstudios, which are all seriously highbrow and made serious drama and it was like composers working there uh, where like the radiophonic workshop was part of the audio drama uh, section and would be designed basically to make sound designs and very unhighbrow and just do all these crazy experiments to tell these stories so i found this yeah huge influence huge influence awesome. um what I, what I wanted to ask, because there's some people who'll be watching this show who don't really have an idea of what test equipment is. So can you explain, how, you know, how you what test equipment is and how you put it into your your music? Oh, test equipment is basically like what synthesizers were before they were synthesizers. So you get stuff that's meant to, for example, send a frequency into a telephone line and then you, you can listen what comes out and can see oh the telephone line works so that's an oscillator it goes beep and then uh you got uh, a filter on the other end to see where it goes wrong so you can see okay uh, there is like a thing at this frequency range and then you go tuck 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 there you've got your filter so you analyze the audio so you get yeah oscillator filter and then you can get all these other things to um, to. No, let me start again. There's so many. Basically, these are the the, the most the most used things. It's like a like a, a sound generator and a filter. That's half of test equipment, and that became in the hands of musicians of the time instruments because they would take a bunch of these and start building sound clusters, or they would take one, record it onto tape 
overdub that tape, overdub that onto tape, and then have all these little tape cuts with like eight layers of notes and frequencies, and then assemble a piece from them. That's uh, Kontakte by uh, Stockhausen. And that is something that's oh, Studio 2. Was it Studio 2? Kontakte also, I think, both. Uh, so, no, Studio 2, exactly, Studio 2. Um, and that is where it becomes really interesting because at that point they thought, oh, this is very tiresome. So they had their text like uh, mod, uh, mod stuff. So they could, um, so Stockhausen wouldn't have to be like in his control room and say, Herr Müller, bitte geben Sie mir 500 Hertz. And uh, then Herr Müller would turn like that dial to 500 Hertz and then Dankeschön. And they would, would a very laborious, torturous process. So at some point they added uh, stuff like voltage control, like Bob Moog added voltage control and all the stuff that makes our modern synthesizers tick. And when you combine all these elements, you can use them basically as giant modular synthesizers. And the nice thing about the whole test equipment is that it's built to a standard that's impossible almost in all synthesizers. For example, I got, and sometimes it even shares the same components. For example, the people that built ARP, they uh, created science op amps basically and science um, uh, filters, for example. And those were then used later in the ARP 2500. And I've got like test equipment the exact filter of the ARP 2500 in a test equipment unit. And that's just glorious to have and sounds great. And you can do so much of it, but that filter in the realm of test equipment was used as part of an analog computer okay. because you could do a lot of like bouncing ball simulations with it. And oh, there's such a world of connection between the test equipment, modular synthesizers, and the synthesizers that we play today. Thank you for explaining that, because I, I had a few people ask me, like when I put up the the show for today, because I, I, I tend to mix with a lot of, um, you know, uh, rock artists and stuff who really don't understand the history of electronic music. And, you know, I think a lot of people just Do think it just happened in the 80s and there was a synthesizer <laughs> and they don't really understand where it all came from and why it is electronic and why computers are, are, have been such an important thing so yeah i mean you can point them to two bands uh like you can point them of course to the silver apples so which basically they they took like all these oscillators and put them together in a big big thing and then played them and built chords with them you can do, 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 do very hands-on yeah. playing it sounds very great and oscillations by them is an amazing tune and then you could go to hawkwind yeah. because they always said they had a guy like with a yeah with the oscillator and an echo and doing crazy stuff with that it has been like test equipment in like in rock music has been there for for yeah for some time and my favorite scene uh, in a book ever is in the crying of lot 49 from thomas pynchon where this is a, it's a very lsd fueled like trip but it's still like the easiest to access book from thomas pynchon but there is a band by the beach in california and that band is called the paranoids and the paranoids are a very modern band because what they do instead of like plugging their guitars in somewhere they plug in their oscillators together and start jamming on the beach i was like this is this is good. I really like, so when I first got one of these big oscillators, I was like, now I feel like one of the favorite scenes in my book. I'm getting that, that face <laughs> that guitarists do, right? <laughs> I remember uh, the first time I, I, I was at the beach once and saw a, a few people sitting on a blanket and they all had all these uh, little oscillators and stuff, all connected all through wires and stuff and little batteries. And I'm like, what the hell is going on over there? Um, and, and I went over and was like, oh my God, these people are making music. This is incredible. And, and since then, <laughs> I've seen that so much. It's such a, a unique little community of people that, you know, and it happens here in Australia too, this, this little beach ghetto of people with electronic stuff all sitting in the sand making music. I think it's a really beautiful thing to see. Yeah. Nice, nice. Yeah. And if you want to like, if you want to like have a taste like of this, of course, a bit fundamental is there. It's just in version 1.4. And this is basically my first test equipment oscillator, a Rode and Schwarz RC generator, which sounds massive. 
supposed to be a sign generator, but due to age and probably not being calibrated and me using it wrong, it overdrives. So it, if you play it like with a touch interface, MPE or something, you can really dive into the tones or you can modulate it. So we, it's more, it's accurate as actually accurately uh, modeled in that app as possible. And then you've got this way to use it as in, yeah, the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, where they also had a row of oscillators that would be used to craft sounds, that would be used to craft, yeah, basically additive synthesize, additive synthesis. By taking a lot of sine waves, putting them together, you get new sounds. So this is, oh, yeah, there's fundamental. So this is basically, uh, yeah, the app that, uh, my first app that I developed together with Sonic Lab, and uh, it is uh, it is that that dream of me to have so many of these that I will never be able to do because eight of these to have eight of these would require another room <laughs> because twenty five kilos per unit oh my god <laughs> so this is I wanted to take these out live with me so now with the, this I can take an iPad and have that sound of my favorite oscillator with me eight times. And then Xenon put in all these amazing stochastic Xenakis and other stochastic musicians-based modulations that I still don't understand, but I don't have to. Because when you look at the lower section down there, that's just like uh, you feeling math through music. And I just love that. It confuses some people, but I think it's... It's gorgeous to just skip through there and discover what you can hear. And with the latest version we included, or he he made up a, a percussive envelope, and suddenly this very droney, very floating thing becomes something that's very ba bum, ping ping, very plonky, plonky and very <laughs> very nice. <laughs> plonky, yeah. This is. I mean, you can use this for absolute massive dark drones, but it can. Just be a very ambient and calm thing. So, yeah, yeah I, d I um, did a review on that. Well, not a review. I, I showed this off, and I've been using this um, God, on so many things. I remember when I did the show on this, it was like, why didn't I have this like 15 years ago when I was uh, for a specific <laughs> noise albums that I've done? I, I and I've, I'm currently doing a an album on this show where I'm trying to create uh, six. Uh, sound six tracks of soundtrack for a fake horror movie I'm making and then once I get all the tracks done I'm gonna upload them and let the community here on the channel all add an extra track to it and then so and mm -hmm. whatever randomness comes back then we'll, we'll put it all together and release it as a community uh, how to app horror movie album and nearly ha half of Very what nice. I've made already for the the basic tracks has been used in fundamental it's such a such a beautiful oh. app like it's i just love its confusion i look at it and just go oh it's overwhelming but i just want to touch everything and and screw with it and there's no wrong way to use it that's what i love about it yeah yeah there's so much stuff that you can do and one thing like that also like when i i actually like moved my rma interface like babyface pro to the ipad and that and then i could run it at i don't know if you can run it even natively at these high sample rates because at uh, 96 kilohertz it really starts to sound even yep. better so i don't know if is that possible like without an external audio face can you do that automatically in arm i've got no idea i like set like a high sample rate you have to have a, a, a um, interface connected I, yeah, I, yeah, but I don't that's think really. The iPad can deal with it because the iPad has trouble uh, going to different apps with um, different um, um, uh, hertz and stuff. It really shits itself. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. That was like uh, when I convinced uh, a poor uh, brand that uh, Gauss should also be standalone because I wanted to be like, yeah, so just record something on the table and use it like standalone. Uh, he never had done, I think he never did a standalone app before. So suddenly there was all these new problems that are of course like also there because iOS is a very difficult platform in the end because it wasn't meant to do all the things that people want to do especially musicians want to do with it so suddenly you had to deal with audio interfaces and all that stuff and oh, i'm still sorry for that but i think it's really nice to have it like to use something like this standalone and yeah just yeah that just uh works in that regard without having to use arm which i also love but for 
Gaussian was important of this immediacy. Yeah. So we'll talk about apps now. I guess you know we've naturally gone there anyway. How 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 did you get involved in it? Like, did a developer come to you? Was it something you reached out to them? And and was the was the process? How did that go? Was it you know communicating with each other and the ideas going back and forward? Zinan visited me in my, in here in Berlin. He was in Berlin. He was holding like a talk at uh, university, and so he visited me and asked if I wanted to collab on an oscillator. And from there we started, and then it was a back and forth, and fundamental came out. With um, Bram, it was um, he. We talked a bit. Um, and, uh, I realized also that he was the guy that did my first drum machine, like the Hammerhead yeah. Studio from for VST. Yeah which I actually bought like in the blue box from Steinberg. And uh, then he asked if I had, he asked me if I had an idea for a fun summer project. A fun summer project. So just, uh, yeah, love... exactly. A fun, that was his word. He wanted something, something fun because he wasn't feeling like all creative in this whole crisis, which is something that happens to many people. So I just said, ah, let me come back to you. And I had like the, the idea for, for Gauss very quickly. Because Gauss is very much based on like my life mm -hmm. setup yeah. also. It is an implementation of how I use the Coco Quantos with a uh, Seat Lombardi instrument with the uh, Mankey uh, Mongchi voltage memory. So and of course my experiences with tape and tape loops. So this unsynced world on and uh yeah, so it became. I think it became a much bigger pro, uh, a much bigger thing than he had anticipated, but it also became like something where, uh, where uh, that that in the end was rather successful. So and fun and very useful. Many people love it, and still people keep on buying it, which is great. So it's uh, it's been such. It's it's one of and for me, it's uh, one of my most favorite tools to make music because I just. I can now record endlessly on the piano over there and with the mics directly. And I don't have to run over here, do another layer, do another layer. I can just create, I could create endless albums or endless soundscapes just over there. And that's amazing to me to have this super powerful studio with an iPad and the interface and yeah, Aum and Gauss, pff, endless, endless possibilities to create music. So, yeah. Yeah, when I uh, first uh, saw the app, I was like, okay, I, what? like with everything, I, I kind of see things pop up and think, all right, I don't know anything about this, let me have a look at it. And I went straight to your video of you, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, you're in your house, just just uh, recording these little things and putting it all together. And I thought, all right, how am I going to, how am I going to use this myself? And it it blew blew me out of the water because I, I rated it out of my top apps as pretty much in the top three, I believe it was. So um, it's it's changed how I do this show every week because I have specific shows where I have drones and things in the background. I use it on virtually everything. Nearly every day I use it now. And coming from a mm -hmm. background of music that's more death metal and all that kind of stuff, it amazes me that something so... so uh, small and lightweight and just easy to use has changed how I look at music. And at, at 48 years old, I'm just amazed that I, I'm still <laughs> able to be amazed and, and, and the wonderment of music. So, you know, thank you for creating it. I think oh. it's a, a, a beautiful app, uh, just like fundamental. Oh, thank you. Very and I, use, I, I think I told you before the show, I do these um, mental health and well-being shows every second Tuesday. And before the show, I just half an hour before the show, I take a whole bunch of, uh, tracks like one of my shows was on on happiness and and finding hope, and I just grabbed a whole lot of uh, tunes like you know a wonderful world, and I just sampled little bits of them, put some in reverse so I didn't get a copyright claim, kind of subliminal subliminal <laughs> messages kind of stuff because I wanted that drone of you know to wonderful world and backwards, and just it, it just did it and it, it it sounded amazing and it really added so much to that. Uh, that show I was trying to create. So I just, I can't praise it high enough. And I'm sure there's lots of people here who love it. So thank you very much. Do you have plans to, yeah, thank do you, you have thank plans you. for any other apps in the future? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. There's already one that I pitched to Bram and I wonder like, uh, we think if it's, that's something that might not be technically possible with the way 
uh, processing speeds are handled. But I think it's a cool idea, and he loved it. Uh, just as to see how it happens. So I'm also doing, uh, yeah, other things with audio thing that will happen. But those are not on app. Those are uh, on uh, on uh, VST AU. Uh, AAX, but now with the whole M1 thing, you never know how the whole like if it like works there and there. I don't know how that whole thing is going to turn out. And yeah, so these are definitely so there will be more coming. So I definitely will keep working on this because I really love putting all these tools into musicians' hands. It's such a rewarding process. It's uh, it's different from releasing an album, but it's. Uh, it's so cool to see what people do and just be help them in their creativity. And I definitely have more ideas, more and more ideas and ideas that for me right now, I want to do things that are a bit off always that are a bit special that I things that I think, um, where people where, where it helps, uh, that will take people to a different workflow as, um, as what's it called as gauss does but it's it will it's presented in a way that makes that playful and easily accessible i think that's like thing the the formula in which i want to go on further with this something off that draws you in makes it playful and then shows you like a new world like with gauss it was unsinking and that was something that in the beta test people were like why can't i sync why can't i set to start why can't i do all these th all these things that they were used to from their standard loopers and that was something that wasn't meant that absolutely not what the point of yeah. gauss was and having put that in that would have destroyed it and would have just made it like one another looper on ios so stuff like that that's kind of the stuff that makes me uh interested in developing further yeah yeah we're a demanding lot the ios community <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah yeah do this, of course do this, do of course. this, do this. <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and always downloading another new app to replace yesterday's app it's a fleet it's a fleeting <laughs> business like um for example like last week i did a show on iOptagon. And you know that's a like th three year old app, and and I only I'd had it on my iPad for like two years and never opened it, and opened it on a pa one of my Patreon no. streams, and then that led me down this rabbit hole to find out what the Mattel Optigan was, and so I did my whole show mm -hmm. last week on the whole history of the thing and how it was made and the the optical mm -hmm. discs, and it took me down this world of just like wow, wow man I just love music for for this and to see that it's recreated on iOS is. Oh, it makes my heart flutter with excitement to, to know somebody painstakingly recreated this bizarre technology from 1971 that we now have on our iPad. Yeah. Where, where do you see the... the... Absolutely painstakingly. Yeah, yeah. Where do you Sorry. see the future of iOS going forward? I hope more people use it. So that's like... Uh, so more people use it and uh, that it becomes something that's... Uh, yeah, as I mean, I was blown away when I saw Total Mix from RME on the iPad. I was like, okay, this is absolutely legit. It becomes this is the perfect mixer. It's fantastic. And now I have it like with the thing that I always wanted touch control instead of like stupid little mouse stuff. <laughs> so Praise. I think absolutely, absolutely, absolutely amazing for that. But there are, of course, limits to that right now. I wish, like, as soon as you can do stuff like have, like, external, inter-external, like, hard disks and stuff or have, like, huge hard disks. So I always, I'm always, because I don't know, I think many people do that. They record both the video and the audio at the same time. And there I'm always a bit anxious about, like, when it's going to run out, when it's going to run out, when it's going to run out. And with the limited memory on the iPad that I have, at least, it's kind of like, ah, is this a given that it's going to yeah. run out and stuff. So I would love to see just more as soon as, like, more powerful, bigger, more RAM, basically, is there. And not it's a RAM. It's called like, whether you know, more, bigger SDs, basically. Then it's just it can replace like a computer for me because also it's super quiet which is absolutely lovely this macbook pro that i have here is a stupidly noisy machine yeah. and the ipad is whisper with whisper uh, quiet and 
yeah, so I think it's just gonna get more and more people attracted, I hope, and more and more people will use it. One thing that I don't hope is that it loses like what Bram described as this this feeling of like uh, like new and excitement. Mm -hmm. Um, for him, he's like old school. He he's been in the '90s in the programming business, so of uh, audio stuff, and he remember remembers that time very fondly. And iOS gives him yeah. that again, so and I completely feel that. And I would be sad to like just see that uh, gone by everybody just porting their traditional apps. You know, like if everything is just like all the same, that's also on the other thing. Ah. That's oftentimes a missed opportunity because some of the more out there stuff like Borderlands Granular, for example, I mean, that's a thing that could only happen like this on the iPad. And it's meant for that. Or what's the one thing that I always use? Also draw. I don't know. I forgot the name. I always forget the name. Soundbow, I think. Mm -hmm. It's Soundbow uh, or something. I really love that. And that's also something. Just drawing it, it's very something very much only possible on the iPad. And I hope that these smaller or like these more out there apps will be still like something that's accepted as this gets all bigger. And basically everybody just once uh, starts asking for native instruments to do massive acts on uh, iOS or something. So yeah, I think the yeah. iPad has a, a, it's so unique. I, I got it. I stopped using uh, PCs in 2012 um, when I got my first iPhone and it was a jailbreaker because back in the day <laughs> to be able to transfer mm -hmm. files between programs you had to jailbreak and, and it, was, it was so troublesome but I didn't give a shit because I, I don't know I could see that I knew that this was going to be the future and I remember back in 2012 people were saying you know oh, the iPad it's just consumption nobody's going to make music on this and do, do you like we talk about this on the show all the time do you even come across other producers or music creators that poo poo at ios yeah. poo poo no 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 i see mostly people that are like this is like best thing so and i talked for example like a long time ago i had a jam with king brit he's like a house uh, dj legend i think he's from philadelphia originally and we did a session at the red bull studios and he just had two ipads and uh, was doing everything with that and i was really intrigued what he did there how he used it so he was big into that uh, into ipad yeah back when i yeah, I couldn't even afford yeah. one, to be honest, at that time. But uh, that's uh, so. Um, yeah, so he was already working with that, and I see that especially one of the guys on the last play, like the the head of the um, sound department, Mark. He was an iOS fiend, and he would always show me like, "Have you tried this? App? Have you tried this? Ah, I'm using Europe now. It's crashed." And I said, "Oh no, can you please use that? Ah, now it works again, but it crashed." And okay, I'll tell it to so stuff like that. So there's a lot of acceptance once people use it. I find they love it, so it replaces a lot of things for them. And one thing why I don't use it as much right now as I used it like before is because I'm not yeah. traveling so it's used to be part of my travel kit but now it's part of the homeschooling kit and it's where my uh, daughter has her zoom sessions for school and stuff so it's kind of out of my hands and I basically need basically to to grandfather her that <laughs> iPad and buy myself yeah. a new one so I can put it up there again so yeah that's basically what I have to do so yeah so I, I can make music again with it <laughs> Not interrupt your Zoom class. So you do, you do so much. Like I want to talk about your your releases now and stuff. But you know, just before that, uh, you know, you you, you uh, uh, there, there's certain creators on YouTube that um, give away so much. You know, and we used to live in a an era where producers and things used to hold on to those things, those secrets that make their music so much. And I find with your YouTube channel, you're so generous with uh, the information that you share. Um, so. Uh, is, is, is this a very conscious thing to, you know, because uh, there are still people out there who are very tight with their, their secrets and you tend to be so free flowing with that and really encouraging. So, um, I did a master's in musicology and in English and 
probably it's that I love sharing information. I think information is there to be shared. And I never really like this trick attitude. This is my trick. This is my trick. It always feel felt bad to me. So I that's one of the reasons why I openly share all the stuff that I learn and that I find like is interesting, like and techniques that I do and how to do them, because then things get better. That's the only way to quickly like have this whole field of experimental music that is very secretive sometimes to make that something into to enter a conversation with other musicians and give more people access and interest, make, thereby making the whole field better and creating more people that try to think a bit out of outside of the box and then develop new techniques from the stuff that I, that I maybe taught. That's also like most of them is old techniques. <laughs> like I never in, don't think I invented anything new with yeah. tape. I think most of these things had been tried before. I just invented new content and new pieces and new compositions with that that are, for example, like the hate loops, um, very unique to our times and only possible in that exact way, in that way, like in the now. So as a composition, it's new, but the techniques, yeah, techniques are second to content and content is the art and the content is the what you put in there and what you search for in your art. So if I share techniques that helps other people express that or find that for them, that's a plus in everything. <laughs> I don't see any negatives about that. So I think it's just yeah, a plus. Totally. I'm the same. That's the whole reason I do this show, you know, just to, and our whole community, we call our community here warts. We're all warts here because we all rise together. And that's what it's all about. Like uh, <laughs> if I want people to come away from my shows each day, better off. So they're more confident to make music and, and, and learn things each day, you know? Um, so oh, I've got up on the screen here, your music and, um, I wanted to ask you because I have your music like at first I had all your music on um, Apple Music and you don't have all of your music on there. You have all of it on Bandcamp. What is the, the... Not all. It's kind of mixed right now actually. On my Bandcamp I have more stuff because I release a lot of stuff exclusively yep. for Bandcamp because I like the site and I like to be there and it's very fast and direct. And uh, then I also have like stuff that I released on labels. So that's not on my band camp. That's on other yep. band camps. That's on their labels band camp and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, so um, you have to basically, I mean, you can, if you buy my whole discography here and then you go to some of the labels, I think I released stuff on, for example, uh, what's it called? Um, Psy Records. You can get an album from me, and then you can albums from me, and then you can get albums from me on um, Opal tapes, and those are not on there. And yeah, it's a bit of a mixed thing right now. There's not one place for everything. Yeah. Um, so, do you, what is it about Bandcamp that he, I, I love Bandcamp as well too? I think it's one of the places that. I, I've discovered so much new music over the past couple of the years since joining compared to Apple. I get lost on Spotify and all that stuff. I just always find unique stuff on on uh, Bandcamp. What is it about Bandcamp that it... Uh, exactly that. Exactly yeah. that. That's from the listener side, all that stuff, because everybody puts up their music sends Bandcamp links, and then I find stuff there that I never would have found anywhere else that way. And then it's the feeling as a consumer again you're supporting directly the artist or this label the small label so you see where your money goes directly and then as the thing as a as a musician it enables me to put out releases super fast and find some audience for them and also like to to make money directly i talked with alessandro cortini about it yesterday and he was also like yeah that's super helpful to put something out bandcamp friday put out something that stuff that that pays you know that helps you uh, deal with all the losses of touring and stuff like that so it's really something that's where you can also put the special stuff that uh like 
for example, when I do a video on a certain piece of a synthesizer or do a whole album basically with just one synthesizer, I don't, and I just want to put it out right now when the video comes out. I don't want to put it up on Spotify and everywhere else, just directly there. It's very yeah. direct and I really find that rewarding. And I always delay my releases. There are one or two weeks they're on Bandcamp exclusive and then they're on all the other yeah. platforms because I think it's good to encourage people to buy music mm -hmm. from there and give music worth. But I'm not against Spotify and such that because I still remember the time when everybody decided collectively that they were never going to pay for music again. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> to have something where I can make at least like I make a tenth of what I make on Spotify compared to yeah. Bandcamp. So that's the ratio basically. But still, it is something. It's not like yeah, nothing. Yeah, of course. And, and and you can't beat that the option to download that high fidelity music from Bandcamp as well. So you have those options to, yeah. to download what in whatever quality makes you happy. That's I love that, that option that you get. So um, we're at the part of the show where I normally ask, uh, do you have a handful of apps that uh, on iOS that you like that make you happy things that are go-to for you of course my own oh, apps <laughs> yes, like I really, excited from them but i really i really enjoy i really enjoy and i play with them all the time but um then there is uh but audio damage eos that's my favorite reverb i really enjoy that it's on everything and then i audio damage again with um I also did a sound pack for that and oh what's it called i did a whole video now i forgot the name the granular synthesizer from audio damage what's its name yeah, i've got up on the screen uh, uh, up here on the screen the 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 phosphor rough rider channels quanta exactly quanta i really love that that kicked me off like for the whole mpe thing and when I saw MPE Im implemented there, I really said, okay, for fundamental, it also needs to have MPE, but it needs to have like a, like a dedicated interface. So that's why we worked with Sensel to get an MPE interface. Yeah, Quanta is something that I really like. Then there is Augen X, I don't know, A-U-G-E-N-X. And that's like this very pure function generator thing. O-G-E-N-X? A. Yeah. A U N E N uh, E N exactly. There we are. Organic space. <laughs> it's always it's always hard to find. There's like a there so it this is. This always exposes me so of things that I don't own yet. <laughs> oh, I wish I could have yeah. all the apps. So this, yeah, this is very good. I made like three tracks with that. Uh, I wanted to do. I don't know why I didn't like make a video on it, but still like this is. I wanted. I think I wanted to make it a part of a iOS music video, which I never got around to. Uh, but this is something that I really love because it is very pure, very powerful, and it has. Yeah, it reminds me of test equipment. And you can do this: plug one function generator into um, another one, another one, another one, and you can create tracks with that. Very in the test equipment way, which is something that's very nice. And this has been definitely one of my most used apps. And I think uh, the guy who did it, he also worked on one of my most favorite reverbs. So the Quadra verb and the Lises Veg. So that's why it's also has a very good sound, I think. So it's very, he's a guy with incredible knowledge and uh, yeah, um, experience. So this is definitely cool. And uh, what else? I think I mentioned Borderlands. Yes, already. So Borderlands Granular. There you go. Got it straight away. Another one. Another one. Exactly. I don't what the hell? <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is this is really this is more like this is not a very arm arm thing. This is just something you you take little things and then you make it very graphical. I tend to use it on its own. I tend to use it more like for how would you say like relaxation mm -hmm. purposes this is not for me to make tracks this is more relaxation but it's it's like a huge accompli accomplishment and the the other one is soundbow that must be one of my absolute favorites so but it's 
the only shame about it that it doesn't like sync with anything. So it's again something you can use standalone and then um, uh, what's it called and then sample it somewhere. Sound bow. B O W. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. There you are. Is it there? Is that it? Yeah. That's yeah. It. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. So very beautiful, incredibly musical, and it can be really played live also. Because I played like a, I met one of the tracks from my album um, Light Splitting, which is on Zy Records, was made with me playing that and Walter van Welthofen playing um, a wire recorder and the modular synthesizer. So very beautiful. I just bought it. I, I knew I was going to end up buying apps, so I just uh, bought that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> you'll love this it's very it relaxing fun. and then there's one and then there's one notation app and i don't know the name i really don't know the name there's one notation app that i use basically to uh to process like uh i'll have to get back to you on that what the notation app name is what's like notation app what's it called it has like it has a built-in audio engine which is pretty nice and cheesy is it even notation pad or they all they all look the same? Yeah. Uh, Symphony Pro. Is it Symph it could be Symphony Pro, I think. Can you just click on that and see if it is? Composed by handwriting. I think it's that. If it has like an audio engine, I think it's that. But I would have to check again because what I like to do is like compose on paper a few things and then put them in the ARM audio player, yep. you know? And then run them to gauss and then yeah change with them so uh this is uh i don't know if it's symphony pro i'll have to check again sure. if it's that but i uh, ipad is w the kids room and i can't go there because yeah. they're sleeping so yeah this is uh this is a notation app that i use and then to basically a sample folder because the sounds are so <laughs> cheesy that they are lovely at half speed. I just um, last uh, a few weeks ago, I bought that uh, Sid chip emulator on here. Uh, okay. I wish it, I wish it was um, uh, you could flip the screen to a uh, landscape. That's the only thing. But just hearing they they put mm -hmm. in there um, the commando music from Commodore sixty four as like a as a free uh, thing. It was the first thing I clicked. I was like, Doo -doo 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 -doo. I was so happy. It was it was worth uh, the fifteen dollars just to just to hear that. And be able to manipulate it as well. It's fantastic. All right, well, so we're at the end of the show. So um, I normally ask this question, and after having Doug on and, and telling me that my last question's stupid last week, I'm going to try and rephrase it a little bit. So uh, if, a, if a creative person is thinking about um, starting to, or somebody who's wanting to get into creating music or art or whatever, uh, it's a, do you think there's a, when do you think it's a good time to, to, for them to take the plunge and do it? As early as possible in their life. I mean, that helps because it's as soon as you commit yourself to something early on and just keep on, keep on, keep on, it, it's really helpful. But it, it depends on your goal. If your goal is to be like, now I want to make this my life, I want to make this my, my, my whole business, the earlier the better if it's the goal to just express yourself or to search for things or just try things or just relax or I don't know maybe just make something beautiful then of course anytime so but I see like my my nephew for example he started he, he interned with me I think two years ago and or one year ago and now he started his own YouTube channel and he's remake doing something completely different he's remixing like uh like german hip-hop stuff and making videos with that and he's seeing some success with that and he's really into it and then i'm i'm basically his creative advisor and i told him he should like he made a, he's started a, 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 some other channel and I told him oh this is perfect for do this on tiktok yes and there it really works and i see this crazy amount of excitement and he puts in so much time for that, more time than in his schoolwork, probably. But he's really, really into that. And that's something that I find amazing when I see it. So I think, yeah, professionally, as early as possible. Or if you've got a crazy cool idea, then any time. But yeah, I started basically really seriously in my head with it when I was yeah. 15. And have been 
I, I designed my life around the idea of living only to make music. And Doug has kindly written in the, the chat, good God, the, that question. And the, there is a reason, there is a reason why I asked that. Because, you know, we, there are a lot of people dealing with mental health and anxiety and fear. So, you know, there, there are a lot of people who are out there who have the ability to create stuff, but the, for some reason they hold back. So the, that is the reason I, I asked this question of, of fantastic creators like yourself to encourage because the answer is always now just do it you know and yeah, of uh, course but to hear yeah, it yeah. from people who are who are doing it hopefully that encourages people who may be f scared to take that plunge or, or to take it further you know what i mean so <laughs> i'm explaining explaining it, my question it's, <laughs> okay it's a like that's a, that's another thing like one thing that you you learn from music and what you but the easiest way is to make yourself happy with that is to get yourself connected to a feedback system. Be it your friends, be it a small community where you hang out and talk about the music that you do, be it like a channel, be it like uh, be it like putting up on Instagram, putting it out on Twitter, putting it, talking about it. I don't know, just get connected to a community where you all talk about the music and you listen and or yeah, then you can advance so much faster because you get a sense of community and you get reflections and with reflections everything gets better so it's the same like when you hear about how reggae was made and dub how so many people used to hang out at the studios and then would just be hey man this is a, this idea let me just jump in and then somebody would do that and it was a very collaborative and collective effort in the end and yeah people just hanging out and then jumping in making music lovely so if you can connect yourself to this kind of feedback system it will help you grow your music and it will make you happier and it's not about the fear of not doing things like the worst fear in that regard i think is like not showing anybody anything that you ever do <laughs> because their fear of rejection all these things it's something you can get over, yeah. I think, and you have to learn. And at some point, you'll be like, "Oh, this is good." I mean, every you hear, like when you hear music with someone, at least that's what I experience. Is when I hear music with a person in a room, and I, and it's my music, I hear through that person. Mm -hmm. Because all of my all of my mirror neurons are firing, and I try to put myself in her or uh, his or whatever place and be that person while I'm listening, and that opens it up for me so differently. I realize, ow, oh, okay, this is works. Ah, it tells me so much. It's like a filter. Yeah. Beautiful so. said. I agree a hundred percent. And um, one of my catchphrases on this uh, show every day is, "Make mistakes. Mistakes make you better." Like, we live definite all <laughs> we live in a digital world uh, Pete yeah. john says it all the time we live in a digital world you have a million retries so just delete and do it again mm -hmm. don't don't be afraid of making mistakes um so, okay mm -hmm. so um mm -hmm. look thank you so much for coming onto the show today here's your website so it's heinbachmusic.com i encourage everybody to go over and and invest in heinbach's um, everything that he does, um, all of the links to <laughs> all of Heinbach's music, social media, they are all in the description. I've tried to get as much as I can in there. So if you want to delve into that rabbit hole, please do so because you will get lost, I promise you, and you'll come out better for it. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for your valuable time today and coming on here. It's been an absolute joy. Um, my day is made. I'm going to be smiling all day today. So thank you very much. <laughs> uh, do you have any last year words you would like to say to people watching on the replay or here who fabulously have joined us in the chat today? So thank you all guys in the chat. Uh, of course, I have to plug yes. something. <laughs> Tomorrow is Bandcamp Friday. So we'll be putting up the last copies of Schwebungssommer. I think there's like 30 copies left. They will be on the band camp of the label it's misc uh minus works.com uh, works.com and uh, no misc minus works dot bandcamp.com 
<laughs> and there you can find the last vinyl copies of my latest album bleep might still have some left so if you want that album on vinyl get it there tomorrow and that supports uh, the small label and me directly and yeah it's it's a lovely album so check that out tomorrow please do so and please uh, jo join the patreon as well i'm about to do that today i looked at it yesterday and i'm going to join after this show um and but we're going to go out today with a track uh we're going to go out today with all roads we cannot travel so uh mm. I'll, I'll just get you to hang on the call too so once the show is finished we'll just have a have a goodbye off off the channel so and if you want to you can choose not to. Once I play this track, you might want to mute again as well. <laughs> so <laughs> thank okay, you so okay. very much. Thank you, everybody. And I hope you enjoy this wonderful track. And yeah, go ahead and grab Heinbach's music. It'll change you definitely 100%. Thanks, guys. Thanks for being here. And have a great weekend ahead. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you for having a me. A pleasure. Bye-bye.